The first item is a discussion of the Savitsky Gole digital filter. And I, I love this filter because it ties together some concepts from, um, from, the, from the previous uh, sections of the course in, digital, or in, uh, in linear fitting to digital filtering. And it's also a really clever idea and it works remarkably well. So uh, that's why I thought it'd be, uh, it'd be useful to spend some time going over that uh, before handing out the exam. So uh, the exam goes out today. We typically do not have class the Tuesday after the exam. Uh, instead, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve that time for office hours. The, uh, I will be out of town on Monday. By the way, <laughs> uh, but I get back, uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I literally, I'm going to spend the day in Texas and then fly back that night. Um, so I'll be back on Monday evening late and then I'll be here on Tuesday. Sorry, Max. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, uh, but I will be holding, we, we will be holding, I'm assuming that you're going to be there with me as well, the, uh, the, the 4.30 to 5.30 um, free-for-all, take questions with respect to the exam uh, tomorrow afternoon as well. So that's in the, um, in the, in the schedule already. Uh, any questions right now before I jump into Savitsky Gole? Well, well, I think it, maybe I'll, what I'll do is hold off on any specific questions you may have until after we tell you what's in the exam. With respect to Thursday's lecture, is there going to be a lecture on Thursday? Uh, the question is really, um, is anyone going to be here if there is one? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so the test is due. We, we, uh, uh, hey, I, I'm inclined to suggest that we don't have one, but I'm open to preparing something if, if you do want to know like how, uh, uh, how FOIA transforms play out with respect to NMR and FTR, FTIR, the, those sorts of practical things, it's kind of entertaining, but it won't really be anything that's related to the exam. I'm happy to put something together um, if you are interested, uh, but the exam is going to be due at, at between 10.10 and 10.15 in front of my office. Um, and we do it there because we usually toast with a little bit of champagne. That's why it's a, it's a narrow window, because we want everyone to turn in the exam at the same time so that we can celebrate completion of 621. Um, so that's, uh, by the way, this is not, I hope this is not being recorded, because I, I meant champagne in the sense that I understand there's a, a, a ban on alcohol in, uh, in, on campus, so that's not, of course, real champagne. Yes. <laughs> but <clears throat> no, we will have all options for all drinkers available. Uh, so, uh, let's see, I, I guess, let, let's, uh, maybe, maybe I sh well, no, there won't be another opportunity. So how, how many people would, would be, well, okay, everyone's going to say they're going to show up, but no one is going to show up, right? <laughs> I know how this is going to happen. <laughs> um, if you are interested, well, we'll put, a, we'll put a burden on you, because then it's easier than raising a hand. Drop Max an email. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you think that you, you would genuinely be likely to show up on, on Thursday, um, sometime before Wednesday. <laughs> and then if there's a critical mass, I'll go ahead and put something together. Um, all right. On to the polynomial filter. And I'm, I'm going to start out with just a, a conceptual problem. Let's take five data points and fit them to a polynomial. So consider... So I'll talk about the end goal here first. End goal, create create a digital filter derived by performing a linear fit at every position in a data set. And we're going to consider a section of five data points. Mm -hmm. 
fit to a quadratic polynomial. And that, that line loosely represents what you might anticipate would be the best fit polynomial for describing those five data points. And it's overdetermined because we have five measurements and three parameters. And what we'll be doing is replacing that center position with the best fit value. So, how do you do that? Boy, that takes me way back, right? Didn't we do linear fitting? That was on the last exam. That, that's been purged from my brain already. That information no longer exists, right? Hopefully it hasn't gone completely away. And we'll see, even if it has, we'll dust off some of those cobwebs and regurgitate your knowledge. That's a nice verb, isn't it? Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for linear fitting. So you may or may not recall, you most certainly recall Now we did this for a linear fit explicitly. Um, how does this play out for a, it's, uh, for, a poly, for a quadratic fit as opposed to a linear fit? It's the same basic idea what we had was beta equals alpha A. Oh yeah. All right, and A is the set of parameters we're trying to solve for. And then if we explicitly write out what beta, alpha, and A are, we can do it this way. Beta is going to be summation of over i x, I'm sorry, just y sub i. Because for um, f of x equals a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared, phi0 equals 1, phi1 equals x, v2 equals x squared. This, if this, this, this may or may not help, depending on how, how, uh, how closely your, your, your memory has, well, depending on, if, if you're old like me, this probably doesn't help at all. <laughs> Maybe some of you have a better memory of these things, though. So phi is the function that we're putting in, and it's a linear fit as long as the, as long as the function is linear in the coefficients, not of the functions themselves. So even though we have an x squared in here, it's still a linear fit because the value of y is, is, is linear in the parameters, a0, a1, and a2. So that's what a linear fit is, and this is just the general form. This, these can be any functions for the quadratic function, or for this quadratic equation, the, the function of x that sits before a0 is simply 1, and the function of x that sits before a1 is simply x, and then the function of x for a2 is x squared. Okay, so maybe that has dusted off a bit. All right, so that's where we get beta. And this is going to equal alpha, which will be, let's see, this is going to be the summation of this thing squared, right? Which will be 1. This will be the summation of this one times this one. This will be x. And then we'll have a summation of x squared. I've left off the indices for clarity. Um, actually, for conciseness, not for clarity. It obfuscates, but does it in a slightly, slightly more concise way. Um, and we can continue this whole thing in terms of where these are populated by different products of phi to make this 3 by 3. Um, I'm just going through these because I happen to know what they're going to end up being. And that's times A.
Does everyone understand? If there's, please interrupt me now if there's any questions as to where these terms came from in that matrix alpha. Because otherwise, I'm going to assume you're fine with it and I'm going to keep going. All right, thank you. Yeah, so let's look at this position. What goes here? The general expression Phi in general is defined as these products, uh, I'm sorry, alpha is defined as, the, as the, these products of phi's, where phi's are the functions that precede or follow the, uh, the, uh, the parameters, a0, a1, and a2, that we're trying to, to resolve. So, for example, we look at this one, it's a summation of phi0 times phi1. Phi0 is 1, phi1 is x, so I have simply a summation of x. If I look at this one, it's going to be the summation of phi1 and phi2. Phi1 is x, phi2 is x squared, so that's why I have a summation of x cubed in there. Yes, there's a question. Wasn't there a factor of, of standard deviation or a These, uh, That's a very good question. So the question is, what happened to the, the, uh, the sigma squared in the denominator of every one of these terms? Excellent memory. Uh, the answer is this is for an unweighted linear fit. So therefore, every sigma is assumed to be the same value, and so therefore we don't have to explicitly consider it in the in the analyses. And there's another question. My question was going to be, why are we using an unweighted fit instead of a weighted fit? So the question is, well, I'm repeating it for the for the purposes of of, of, uh, of the recording. But the next question is, why are we doing an unweighted fit? Two reasons. First, it's easier. <laughs> Second, um, I have no idea what the weightings should be and why they should be different. Uh, if you ask yourself, under what conditions do you have a different weighting, um, a common one is a scenario where you're doing Poisson noise, where the variance is proportional to the mean. However, in most measurements, um, you, you have normally distributed noise. And in normally distributed noise, the noise is independent of the value. If we just think about electronic noise that simply adds to whatever value you have for your measurement, then that's the standard deviation. The noise about that value is really constant no matter where you're making that measurement. Uh, and that's the most common scenario, and certainly it's the simplest. We could add in weightings, but that would uh, definitely complicate the final result, and, um, and I'm not sure even why we would be able to rationally justify it in many applications. So we'll go with the simpler unweighted case because that's most likely to describe the, the, the most common set of measurements in which digital filtering would be applied. Other questions? Okay, excellent. I will move on then. Okay, so we've got this matrix here. Now, what values of X do we choose? Well, if I look at this, this data set here, it makes sense to define this to be zero. X equals zero. Right? And then this data point here happens at x equals minus 1, this is at x equals minus 2, and this is at x equals 1, x equals 2. So it's zero centered. Where that zero is also corresponding to the position that I want to do the filtering around. Okay? So we'll get to filtering. Right now we're not even there yet. We're just doing a fit to five numbers. That's all we're doing. We'll see how this ultimately turns out to be a filter later on. All we're doing is doing a best fit to five numbers to a quadratic function. But we're going to, do, we're going to choose to define the zero in x as the center point. What does that do for us? Well, for one thing, let's think about the summation over x. Summation of x is from negative 2 to 2, right? So I'm going to have, this is going to equal explicitly negative 2 plus negative 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 2. Which, last time I checked, sums to 0. Um, what about summation of x cubed? It's 
negative 2 cubed plus negative 1 cubed plus 0 plus 1 cubed plus 2 cubed also equals 0. No. Yes. Yes. So all odd fun odd powers of x will sum to zero. All even powers of x will not. In fact, it's worthwhile go ahead and explicitly evaluating this. The summation of one for i equals negative two to two is just equal to one plus one plus one plus one plus one, plus one equals five. All right. The summation of x squared is going to be negative 2 squared plus negative 1 squared plus 0 plus 1 squared plus 2 squared, right? It's going to equal 2 times 1 plus 2 squared. 2 times 5 equals 10. And finally, we have one more to go. And that's going to equal 2 times 1 plus 2 to the fourth. That's 34. Yay. Pretty exciting stuff, right? Okay, so we can actually go in and use that to start populating this matrix alpha. So I can rewrite this as beta equals We'll do the substitute. Actually, I'm going to hold off on explicitly substituting these in. But the, the key is that we know what the zeros are. We know what the values of every one of these elements in the matrix is. How do we solve for a zero? The goal is to solve for the intercept at x equals zero, which i.e. a0. Does it make sense why we want to solve for a0? Maybe not. I'm seeing no one, I'm, I'm seeing no one say, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So I'm going to assume that it's not absolutely positively clear for everybody. Let's go back to this figure. Is it clear looking at this figure why I want to solve for a0? Yeah, because if I'm thinking about this in terms of what, I'm going to apply this best fit filter to find the, the, the most probable value for that center position, the one right here at zero, which is the intercept. And that is the value of A0. So ultimately, I actually don't even care about A1 and A2. If it makes, at the end of the day. I'm still going to use them in the analysis to, to convert the math and use them as a polynomial function that I'm fitting. But at the end of the day, the only parameter I care about in, in terms of smoothing the data is the intercept alone. So that's why I say that the goal is really to solve for the intercept. But we're going to do that by at least initially solving for the vector A and then considering what the solution looks like just for that zero entry. So if I solve for A, what do I get? If I have beta equals beta equals alpha a, how do I solve for a? Yeah, remember this? We do um, alpha negative one times beta. And that gives me a. So how do you find the inverse of a three by three matrix? <laughs> uh, 
Um, the answer that was re that was returned to me is Wolfram or MathCAD, uh, depending on on uh, on how bitter you are about MathCAD so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a perfectly valid answer. <laughs> In fact, that is by far the path of least resistance. It makes much more sense to evaluate this num numerically. In fact, only for the quadratic fit with the five element filter is it worth going through and illustrating how it works out explicitly and analytically. And that's the only example I'm going to give. Anything else beyond that, you would simply you know, plug in the values for alpha, you know, have, a, have something generate the inverse, and you're good to go. And that works. Yes. Um, ma uh, MathCAD. MathCAD will tell you. Um, okay, but let's go ahead and it's, the, we have time. Uh, let's go ahead and, and explicitly do this. Um, so I had to just go back and refresh my memory about inverting a three by three matrix. So if you go, yeah, we'll keep that, why not? If you go to the internet and ask, how do you define, how do you find the inverse of a three by three matrix? You get this nice expression. Because you lost, the, you've lost the screen. It looks fine on my screen. I don't know why you guys are complaining. Every once in a while, it does that when you when you pop out a PowerPoint. Confuses Microsoft. It's like me, easily confused. All right. So if there's a, then a is alpha, right? Alpha inverse. It's one over the determinant of alpha, and then a whole bunch of little determinants. Um, so you may recall, uh, if we want to know the position of this, oh, it doesn't let me do it right on the screen in, in, uh, if I'm not in PowerPoint, does it? Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that anyway, just for fun. So this one, if I do it fast enough, it doesn't really think I'm doing anything. Okay, there we go. If we look at that top left corner, how do you find the, the, the value of that one? It's the determinant of all of the remaining spots, right? You sort of exclude that row and column and the determinant, find the determinant of that one. And then if you go over one, you do the exact same thing, except you have to multiply by negative, by negative one. And then if you go over one more, it's positive again, and it's the other quadrant. So I don't know, maybe this is helping for those of you who, who to have taken linear algebra many moons ago. For those of you who have not, sorry that you were neglected this opportunity in your youth to be exposed to linear algebra. It's a fantastic tool. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and explicitly evaluate what this looks like for our immediate problem at hand. So we can plug in, well, let's leave it as, let's see, do we want to write, we'll leave it as the summations, because, and I'll, I'll do that because that's the notation that's used in the lecture notes, and if you want to have a, uh, that serve as a resource to complement the, the content I'm delivering right now, I'll stick with that in terms of notation. We could just as easily put the values that we calculated here in right now, but I'll hold off on that. So if we just do explicitly, what are the, uh, what is... Uh, if, I, if I want to determine the inverse of that matrix, I'm going to have one over the determinant, so alpha inverse, one over the determinant of alpha. We'll figure out what the determinant of alpha is in a moment. And that's going to be multiplied by this matrix where the top left corner, if I go, it's probably going to pop me out if I do this. Uh, top left corner, it will be the determinant of the remaining regions. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, cancel. Abort. Okay, let's try it and see what happens. I think that's what it was. So the, it, it, the determinant of the top left will be, we'll have the summation of x squared times the summation of x to the fourth minus zero. Oh, I skipped one. That would be this entry times that entry minus this entry times that entry. And then the next one would be zero. Oh, oh, and then I'm multiplying that. That's right, I forgot. And then I'm multiplying that by one, a summation of one. So it's this number times the determinant of this for the inverse. No. no, 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 that's for the determinant, but not for the inverse. Okay, 
So we'll forget about this for now. We'll worry about that when we, when we start trying to tackle the denominator. <laughs> linear algebra is fun, isn't it? This is why, uh, this is why um, people who do linear algebra were so excited about the advent of computers. Uh, at least, that's, I'm going to assume that was the case. <laughs> All right, so for the next entry we have, um, let's see, it'll be 0 times x to the fourth minus 0 times x squared. to zero. And then the rightmost entry will be x squared times x squared minus zero. No, it'll be, I take it back, it'll be zero minus that. Yeah, if I'm looking at this entry, it'll be zero minus summation of x squared times summation of x squared. Negative, oh come on, don't do that to me. So that'll be negative. <laughs> And then this entry is going to be um, 0 minus. It would be the same thing, right? Is that right? This one will be 0. If I'm looking at this one, it will be 0 minus 0. That's what I meant. Why don't you guys just tell me what to write in this? That'll be much, much way, way faster than me doing it. I think the next one's zero. The next one is going to be this one times that one minus this one times that one, which will not be zero. Yeah. Isn't it? Oh, it's the summation. Right? Yep. So this one is going to be summation of one, summation of x to the fourth minus summation of x squared squared. Is that right? And then the position here is going to be 0 minus, let's see, position here is going to be 0 minus 0. Okay, now we're cooking. This bottom left position will be 0 minus x squared squared. And then this one will be 0 minus 0. And then the, the, the last one will be x squared minus 0. Or x, 1 times x squared minus, wow, that's a big question. <laughs> this will be 0, and this will be Is that right? And the determinant, while we're here, might as well figure it all out. The determinant of A, now we go ahead and do this whole product thing. So this will be the summation of 1 multiplied by x squared times x to the fourth minus 0. You can see why we're only going to do it with this one case. <laughs> and in fact, I'm getting tired of going back and forth. So the next position is going to be 0 times something. I don't care what that something is. That will be a 0 there. Uh, the rightmost will be x squared times x1 times x squared. No, wait a minute. x squared times 0 minus x squared squared. Which gives us that, correct? I'm, I'm trusting people to stop me if I'm wrong. Um, oh, yes. Thank you. All right. Now, this one will be 0. I don't care about it. The middle one will be x1, x4 minus x squared squared.
okay? It's a mess, right? Linear algebra is terrible. And then the last two entries will be 0 minus x squared, uh, actually, it'll be x squared times, it'll be x cubed, right? Uh, negative x cubed. Negative x, uh, negative quantity summation of x squared cubed. It's hard to say. It's so much easier to write. Okay, and then the last one will be x1, be x, x to the fourth times x1 times x squared minus zero. Phew. All right. Remember all of these. <laughs> Because now we have to say um, a0 equals what? Right? <laughs> and how do we get there? We, we'll have to remember that a0 is going to equal, uh, let's just do it this way. Let's go back a step and say a0, a1, a2 is going to, is going to equal alpha inverse times beta, right? Alpha inverse, we just figured out. summation of y times beta. And this was the, 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 the numerator is given by this. And the denominator is given by that. Only this should be a scalar determinant. I'm sorry? The determinant should be a scalar value. How do we mess up that scalar evaluation for the determinant? Someone help me out here. Who knows linear algebra? Okay. Say that one more time. The diagonal this way minus the diagonal this way. Okay, so here is alpha. The determinant is given by, oh, oh yeah, it's just that first row. Yes. We don't need the rest of it. We, we, we wasted our effort. You guys should have stopped me sooner. <laughs> okay, so my apologies. We don't need any of this. This is the determinant. That makes me much happier. Okay, so then this now becomes a matrix in the numerator and that scalar value of this thing minus this thing in the denominator. Okay. And that is equal to A, the whole set of them. But of course, we really only care about A0, right? So how do we calculate A0? Well, it's going to be beta times the first row of the matrix. So in fact, we didn't even need to make the whole matrix. We just needed to make the first row. But we got a lot of good practice in, right? Yeah. Me giving you misinformation. It was very entertaining. And now it's recorded for, for in perpetuity. All right, I digress. Um, so we will go ahead and multiply beta, the elements of beta by the first row of alpha inverse, which is this row. And it's actually kind of nice because we only have two elements of beta that we have to consider in the evaluation as well. So A0 is going to be the summation in Y times this entry. What was that entry? X squared X4.
minus the summation in x squared y times this entry. Well, actually, plus that entry, but that entry has a negative sign. And that's x squared, and then this whole thing is over the determinant, which is 1, 2, and 4, minus summation of x squared cubed. Let's go ahead and plug some actual numbers in now. Uh, let's start out. Well, we can't do anything about this one because that's determined. That's dependent on the data set. We can. Do, uh, sorry, is there a question? Uh, this is a. So this is the summation of y. Yeah, sure, that'd be easy. Let's do that. Does everyone see that? I can pull out one common factor of x squared in all of this, and that will give me a0 equals, oh, what will that give me? The summation of y times the summation of x to the fourth. And then minus the summation of x squared y. Oh, times summation of x squared. Because I had two of these, I'm only pulling one of them out. And then now this becomes over summation of 1, summation of x to the fourth, minus summation of x squared squared. Looks good? OK. Now we're finally in a position to take advantage of these numbers. Summation of x squared is 10. Summation of x to the fourth is 34. And summation of 1 is 5. So let's go ahead and plug those back into this. Thirty-five is x to the fourth, right? Minus Summation of x squared is 10. And then summation of 1 is 5. Summation of x to the fourth, 35. And then minus 10 squared is 100. Right? I can see that I have a factor of 5 I can get rid of, too. Oh, I'm sorry. This should not be 35. 34. That makes life more interesting. Otherwise, it would be boring. Okay, fine. We'll make it 34 in the bottom, too. Jeez. Um, the only thing I can pull out is a factor of 2 instead of a factor of 5. So if we pull out a factor of 2, this becomes... Uh, okay, 5 times 34 is 170. Okay, so this becomes a um, hundred. No, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, it becomes 170 minus 70, so or minus 100. So we'll end up with 70 in the denominator. So if I divide both the numerator and denominator by two, I'll end up with 35 in the denominator, right? And then the 34 becomes 17 summation of y minus five. Summation of x squared y. Yay. All 
And I'm going to explicitly write in here i equals negative 2 to 2 y sub i. X, I, Y, I. Boy, you can't read that at all, can you? We know the summation is explicitly from I equals negative 2 to 2. I've left them out, but I'm going to put them back in because we're going to explicitly evaluate each of those five terms. What happens when I equals negative 2? Well, then I'm going to have 17 times Y, negative 2, minus 5 times negative 2 squared times y negative 2 over 35. This is, just, this is the one of the five terms in the summation, right? And what does this, I can simplify this a bit. 5 times negative 2 squared is 20. Right, this is 5 times 4. So 17 minus 20 is, oh, let me think, carry the 1, negative 3. All right. So I have a negative 3 over 35 times y negative 2. All right? We can just do the same thing again. i equals negative 1. We'll have, that's going to equal... 17 times, well, 17 y times y negative 1. And then that's, what is that? Minus 5 times negative 1 squared. Five times, or 17 times 5 is, uh, is 12. So this will equal... 12 over 35 plus 12 over 35 times y negative 1. i equals 0 is even easier. It's 17 times y 0 plus 0 over 35. Because of symmetry, Turns out it's an even function and we're always squaring things. So the coefficient for i1 will equal the coefficient for i negative 1 because that, that negative 1 always appears as, as, a, as a square. So this one will correspond to 12 over 35 times y1 and i equals 2 will be negative 3 over 35 times y2. And the total value of a0 is given by the sum of these five terms. The most, I'll write that down here. Does that make sense? If it does, then I have you. Because that is digital filtering. Right? Because if you think about it, what am I doing? I'm, I'm taking, I'll go back to the very beginning here. I'm taking and calculating the most probable value of A0 right here. Right? And I'm doing that by, weight, by a weighted sum of these five numbers. And the weightings are described by a digital filter. And these are the, the values that we obtain. Yes? So the question is, is this done just like I was describing in previous digital filters where you evaluate this um, each, each, each point and then move over one pixel and reevaluate and then move over one pixel and reevaluate as opposed to doing it in blocks of five like binning? And the answer is yes, this is not binning. This is convolution. We are doing this one element at a time throughout the entire data set and we lose the first two and the last two elements in the data set. But it's really just a digital filter at the end of the day, right? The digital filter is, 
is 1 over 35, negative 3, 12, 17, 12, negative 3. It is. But what's slick about it is that it's this it's just weird to me. You know, the first time I saw this, I was like, no, this can't be. This is just a this is just a digital filter. How is this performing a quad a, a polynomial best least squares fit at every position? If that's true, why am I always multiplying things by exactly the same numbers? Right? <laughs> And it just beautifully turns out to do precisely that. So this is always, because we, and the reason it works is that we're, we're not caring about the other two coefficients. If we're only ever solving for the intercept, life is easier. And if we're only ever replacing the center value for, with, of the intercept, then it does turn out to always be the exact same set of numbers, each position irrespective of the values of y. So it's slick. Ties everything in, right? Except for Fourier transforms. Um, so, what knobs can you tweak with the? Uh, this is called the Savitsky Gole uh, uh, filter. For those of you who are familiar with it, what knobs can you tweak? There's two knobs you can tweak. The first and most obvious is the length of the filter. You'll get different weightings for each position if you increase the length of the filter beyond 5. 5 is the minimum because it has to be overdetermined in order to do a least squares fit. Um, and the shortest equation that we could do is a polynomial. So that was by far the, this is the one that we worked through right here is the simplest possible savitsky gole digital filter one could generate. Um, you can have them be very long, a couple hundred uh, elements long, for example, in a digital filter. Uh, and it's just, that, that, so it's a very powerful knob to tweak. And you'll tweak that knob based on the characteristics of the frequency dependence in your signal. If you make it longer, you're fitting it to uh, a quadratic function that can only vary as a single quadratic over that entire range. That works great for rolling features, works terrible for things that have sharp features in, associated with them. So you have to bear in mind the frequency content of your signal and the frequency content of your filter still. So Fourier transforms don't go away completely. Uh, but that's one knob to tweak. The, the, the other knob to tweak is, is one we haven't really mentioned. That is the order of the polynomial. You can either go out to quadratic, as was illustrated explicitly in, in this presentation, or you can go out to the fourth power, the quartic. Um, the odd ones we all saw disappeared. So there's really no point in going um, from quadratic to cubic, because you get exactly the same thing as quadratic. Uh, but if you go out to quartic, you can, uh, you can get a, an, an improved recovery of high frequency sig content in your signal. Because it has a higher order polynomial, can respond more quickly to changes, rapid changes in your signal waveform over that uh, over that range. So those are the two knobs to tweak. But that gives you a two-dimensional surface. So that, that's a lot of flexibility, actually, in a digital filter. Uh, so it's it's quite uh, quite helpful. Okay. Now, any questions? Cool, right? Wasn't that? Eh, eh? No love for okay, fine. Maybe, maybe, in a, maybe you 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 won't admit to it right now that it was cool. That's what I. That's what my kids, I'm sure, uh, are doing. They just they just won't admit that I'm cool. Right? That's what's going on. Um, okay, on to the exam.